Good night, everyone. Welcome to Globespan 24-7 once again. I am Ashi Kisun from The New Movement. I will be your moderator tonight. I would like to let the audience know that tonight we're going to have a very interesting show as it's all about women fighting for democracy in Guyana. We will art be joined soon by our other guests, but allow me to introduce you to Ms. Gail Teixeira. Good night. Welcome to the show. She is a member of the People's Progressive Party Civic. We also have Ms. Rhonda Lam from the Citizen Initiative. Welcome, Ms. Lam. And we are to be joined very soon by Priyamani Chan also. So while we're giving them a few minutes just to get themselves together so we can get the ball rolling, I'd like to remind everyone to send in your questions so that we can go forward and answer them and have an interactive session with you tonight. So like I said from the beginning, the topic tonight is women fighting for democracy in Guyana. And if we are to speak about that, the panel sitting before you are those women who have been in the forefront from the very beginning, from campaigning, nomination day, election day, post elections, all the way up to now, 100 plus days, 140 something plus days after that process being drawn out, we're still here in the forefront, continuing our fight for democracy. As we move forward, I would like to start the night by giving a small tribute to a bald hero. There are few people that come into your life and make an impact or a difference. And we have lost one of those heroes recently, Owen Arthur. So I will just ask for a couple seconds of silence to pay respect to him. Thank you. <clears throat> That's it. So Gail, welcome once again. I would like to start the ball off rolling with you tonight. We're here, we're on the ground, we're working with people every day. I know there are a lot of projects and programs that you're involved in right now. But the first thing I'd like to ask you is what's your assessment of the atmosphere, the political atmosphere in Ghana right now in relation to what the people are feeling in your opinion? Well, good night uh, viewers and thank you, Dr. Kisun Asha for inviting me and good night, Rhonda, nice to see you. We can only meet in this virtual world sometimes. Um, and I know that my colleague uh, Priya Manik Chan will be joining us soon. It has been almost five months um, that we have been at this uh, after March the 2nd. And the resilience uh, of the Guyanese people and the discipline is, is really phenomenal. Um, but it is dragging on. It is dragging on. It has been unbearably long. And our people have endured a lot. And on top of that, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which is really making life extraordinarily difficult, particularly in many communities of our country and most especially in the interior. So that at this point we have been, we have as a people and those who stand for democracy, not just the People's Progressive Party Civic, but all the other parties and civil society bodies, excluding APNO, unfortunately, that have over from March the 2nd in particular, been successful in countering several efforts to derail the elections, to hijack the elections, and that we're still at it, working to prevent um, those forces amongst us who would like to take us down a precipice and, and to, to derail our democracy. And so I think that uh, the resolute, resoluteness of our people have been astounding and that we continue to be strong and to not be bullied by those around us and who would have it any other way. So I, that's my assessment. I think that, um, that uh, we still have some time to go, but I think that we have shown the strength and resilience of our people for democracy. Thank you very much. Rhonda, welcome dear. I know you're also Hi, on the ground. You're doing work with the people every day. You have projects going on, sharing out hampers and helping. What's your assessment of how the people feel right now, given the political atmosphere in Guyana? What we have on the ground right now, and it, it's been a 
you know, concentrated efforts since uh, just about the end of March, continuing all the way to now. I've been out into the field and I've been able to, you know, have a, a kind of sense of what is going on on the ground in that sense. Our people are struggling. Um, you know, a lot of families have lost their ability to earn. Um, we're now starting to open back up. We need to use that term. We're hitting just about to hit the 400 COVID, COVID mark in terms of cases. And so what we have is, uh, you know, quite a, a number of families in this country who are struggling and to be faced with an electoral crisis in the middle of a pandemic is a double whammy for Ghana. We are an emerging nation. You know, oil is on, it is here. It's, it, it's ready and we should have been enjoying the fruits of, well, at least of a, at least a, of a badly negotiated oil deal, but still enjoying some kind of um, fruits from that. Instead, what we have is a double whammy. So while, as I agree with Gail, you know, our people are resilient, they are still struggling. And to add an elections crisis to a pandemic is not a good good thing if we're looking at it from that perspective. So that's, that's what's happening with the ordinary man in the street. And of course, they cannot understand why it is, you know, the actors, so to speak, are not moving ahead, why, why we're not getting a declaration why we, you know, why we're running to court every five minutes. And there's very little you can explain to them because to them, it's over and over again. It's like a never ending um, merry-go-round for them. All right, thank you very much. I could tell you that for the last two weeks, at least, people have been reaching out. They have been asking for assistance in any way because they still don't have their jobs back. They're still struggling. They have been making a plea, but given the um, situation that COVID cases are still going up, even though some of them are afforded the opportunity to go out and work, they're still scared because they believe that proper preventative message methods haven't been put in place as yet. So while we wait for Priya, um, tonight we're in a unique position to let the public know women's special role in politics and how far we have come so far. Um, I'll go back to you, starting with you, Gail. Can you give us a run through of what your experience as a woman has been in this 2020 election campaign? Well, the, the struggle, I think, for all of us women has been one in which we are confronted probably than more than any other time with, and what I've seen in these last, um, well, going on five months, as I said earlier, is a level of discrimination and contempt in particular for women. And, and I say this because um, we've struggled for women's rights for a long time. We've achieved some things. We haven't achieved other things. And that we saw over the last five years a number of reversals of women's rights. Um, but in this these few months, we've seen a level of what I have called misogyny, and that is what I believe it is, where there's actually contempt for women in our society by um, the APNU. So when my friend Rhonda talks about we are running to court, in fact, we haven't been the ones running to court. We've either been defending or appealing decisions. So uh, the we is not Awidis, but the the uh, government. <laughs> so, but the I just wanted to make that correction, but. What has been phenomenal, and I've been around for a little while, um, and what I'm really, ex I, I feel so positive and hopeful for the future, despite the fact that we're facing two crises simultaneously, a political one and a, a health crisis, is the fact that in these elections, as probably in no other, um, since probably the 1950s, I wasn't around then, of course, <laughs> but the the involvement of the youth, of young people, the involvement of young women in particular, um, has been extraordinary, extraordinary. And so whilst people are going around saying, well, you know, and you read in certain articles that are printed internationally, there's these two monolithic parties with two monolithic ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. In fact, it no longer represents the truth mm -hmm. of Guyana in the sense that and so the, the, the 
the fact that we were able to block on March the 5th in the attempt to bring out the spreadsheet and declare the elections was because of this huge body of people, particularly young people that were in Ashman building, representing various parties, that said absolutely not. And with the support of the international observers, the support of civil society, that coming, that coming together forces we've never seen in this country on that magnitude. And so, yes, in, this, in the 80s, when we were struggling for free and fair elections long before you were born, is that the we, we were basically PVPC with the WPA at that time and a number of the trade unions and the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. By 1991, that was it. But this time, it is a huge movement that is pro-democracy. And I think that this is what has caught the APNU AFC off guard is that we have been confronted now with this large group of young people from various parties, the civil society again with young people and young women in particular like yourselves, as well as the force of a hundred countries saying that the recount was transparent, it was credible and the legitimate government of this country must be sworn in. So once we look at the five months of how difficult it's been and how how we've endured, we must also look at the fact that for the future, what has taken place is absolutely uh, phenomenal and something very special that we need to protect and guard. We will have differences after these elections of how we fight on different issues or different issues we will stand for. But one thing we do know now, whether you're PVPC or TNM or Citizen Initiative or uh, URP or whatever it is that we all stand for one thing and we're willing to go to the battle lines on one thing and that is democracy and that I think is something that that's unbelievable of course we confront as I said in the beginning the behavior of the APNU AFC and particularly the negative aspect of what is taking place in this period is the attack on women particularly women in high office such as the chairman of GCOM such as the justices George and um and Roxanne and uh, Priya Bihari, as well as Prime Minister Maya Motley, as well as a High Commissioner Chatterjee and, and uh, Ambassador Lynch. This is the negative side of what has been transpiring in terms of a, of a pro-democracy movement that is that has caught the PNC with their pants down, literally. They didn't expect this at all. All right, thank you very much, Gail. That's very well said. Let us welcome Priya Manichan. It's lovely to have you here with us tonight. Hi, Priya. Just to, thanks, just thanks, just Sasha, for inviting me. Hi, Gail. And um, we started off by discussing um, what the, your feel, your opinion is of the people's attitude with the political atmosphere that's happening right now. In your assessment, how do the people feel about the process, the people you've been interacting with and that have been approaching you? You know, it's it's extremely interesting. Thank you very much, Asha, for having me tonight. Um, Gail and Rhonda, hello. Sorry for being late. We had some uh, connectivity issues with Skype. I'm not a uh, very familiar with the 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 whole uh, forum of Skype. I usually use Zoom or the other features, but I'm very glad to to be here, and I'm very glad that you have this forum, and I'm really glad you asked that question because. Um, up to the 2nd of March, I thoroughly enjoyed the competitive, high-spirited um, election campaign that we had. I love that uh, people felt strongly about their parties, that that they had these new parties, that they had some women candidates such as uh, yourselves, um, that we had young parties, that we had young people. And I, I was even sharing APNU women particularly. Um, when they were named to the list or when they said something or when they were because it is beautiful to see people involved. So up to the 2nd of March, that was really nice. And then what happened after that? Um, I mean, we'll go into what happened after that. But between the 2nd of March and now, I could tell you and I'm pretty sure all of you here have had the same experience that people who voted AP and UAFC who have said very clearly, I, I can't I don't want a PPPC government in place 
have come out to say that I cannot support the rigging of the election. And the only thing that the AP and UAFC is attempting to do here is to rig an election. And so you have people like Dominic Gaskin, who for me remains um, someone very special. That could not have been easy for him to do, um, but his children must be very proud of him. Um, Supriya Singh, who said that she, she will give back her um, medal. Um, other persons, a young businesswoman, Angelique, who wrote a letter saying um, that she voted for the APNU 2011, 2015, 2020, and um, this cannot be what they're doing with her vote. And these are people who are putting their names to letters. And then you have people all over social media who are saying, you can't, you can't use my vote for this. And you can't do this to me because I don't like any of the other parties. I like the APNU or I like the PNC and you're not giving me options. I don't even see myself being able to vote for you again, ever. You are never getting my vote again. And so that's where we are right now. Um, and it's it's uh, it's saddening to move from election campaign that had so much involvement in my view from I'm not that experienced, but from 2006 to now watching elections, this one has had the most involvement of our young people, a wide cross section of young people, um, older people, people in professions, people without professions, um, just just so much involvement to be met with this damp squib now. I mean, this could have been so good for our democracy, so good for um, consultative movements or, around the place, so good for accountability. You know, you have you have Rhonda Lamb with her new party, Nasha Kishun, Kishun with her new party, uh, holding a Gail Teixeira and a Priya Manik Chan accountable, not only for uh, doing things that their and party- vice versa, promised, And vice versa. <laughs> not yes, not only holding things their party promised. Well, we won the election, which is why I'm saying holding us accountable that our party promised, demanding more also and saying you didn't promise this, but it has now arisen and, and you have to give us these things, not only for women, but for the people who depend on women, children, young people, um, various services. And so it's to, to move us from where I said we were on the 1st of March, perhaps, to where we are now, where people are fighting for such a basic right for me is, is just so frightening and of such a waste and um, something that we must never, ever, ever let happen again. And so some of the old fossils in the PNC who are causing this must never see political power in the executive again because they cannot be trusted with um, respecting the will of the people once they're in there. Okay, thank you, Priya. Before I go on to you, Ms. Lam, let me mention that I made a lot of efforts today to have a female representative from the APNU join us tonight. However, it was futile. My request was turned down by many. I wanted to open up the platform so that everybody could have an equal voice tonight. We have new party representatives. We have you, Priya, who is civic. We have um, Ms. Gail, who is PPP. So I wanted to have everybody here to represent themselves, to speak out about the issues that are affecting our people, because I truly do believe that we could only do it together. At the end of the day, it is all about the importance and what is best for the people of Guyana, pride aside, motives aside, it comes down to working together to help the Guyanese people get where they need to be. Ms. Lam, your personal experience since this electoral process has gotten there, could you share a bit of that with us, please? Um, well, of the entire panel here tonight, I can say that, um, you know, I think I've, I've carried it down to the end, you know, all of recounts and not knocking you, you ladies, but I have that first hand account of that recount process. You know, I sat throughout the entire tabulation of 2000 plus boxes heard every single observation report. I saw, I even sat through, you know, post, I believe it was over the 35 day period, post or somewhere in the vicinity of 200 plus boxes. So my perspective, you know, whilst yours might have stopped up to the point of just after um, Ashman's or continuing, mine continued throughout. And what I saw, and I have to agree with Priya here, was all of these young people 
who were there, they were sitting, they were counting those um, ballots, ensuring that, you know, the will of the people was represented. And that was heartening to see because as a teacher, I've been saying to young people for 21 years, you know, this is the time for you to step up. Your country needs you. You have to. And then, of course, I also have to answer to those um, young people who would have voted for the first time. Over and over again, I've had, heard young people say to me, I'm never voting again. My vote means nothing. And this is not coming from persons who would have voted just a uh, small party or PVP. It, it's coming from young people who I know would have voted even for the incumbent. And so a lot of them are frustrated and, you know, they're asking questions that realistically, I can only tell them what I experienced, but then we have all these court cases. They don't understand what's happening and you're trying to explain and they're saying, but none of this makes sense. And then what we have is the older generation saying things like, we told y'all this was going to happen. And so what you have is a clash of a lot of things and, and you who have experienced it from the campaign right through to nom um, you know nomination day, moving into elections all the way onwards. What you have for me and what I like is this new group of politically um, aware Guyanese. I can't begin to tell you how many of us probably know have read the constitution for the first time since all of these matters have come to the front. And so that, that, those are the good things that have emerged. Of course, the negatives, five months later, we still can't have the government the people voted for. So we're hoping that that ends soon. But for the most part, um, the elections experience, persons have asked me over and over again, would I do this again? Do I regret it? I don't. It has, I have daughters and, you know, that to show them their responsibilities, not only as citizens of this country, but as women stepping up and entering into certain roles. That is, I think, minus the negatives of the last, uh, you know, last past year or so. The, I, I'm opting to take the positives. And those are the things that I see and I like. And we hope that we're going to be able to show them that, you know, these are the positive things, paying attention to your constitution, you know, seeking change that would allow meaningful dialogue and those kinds of things. So that's what my experience would be if I would have to, you know, tell people what it was like. Great. Well, I think you ladies know my experience. I've shared it many times with you. Our party made a big decision to allow a woman to go forward. For the first time, it was a Guyanese woman that took that step. And I've never looked back since. A positive thing about this election is that we are learning a lot, like Brenda said. Um, I could not have gained any of this experience if this had not happened. I can tell you about court cases. I could quote the Constitution now. And it's quite, you know, it's a struggle, but they, we need to also be positive. Speaking of court cases, I'd like to start with you on this topic, Priya. We have a court case coming up tomorrow, and today, Plot Singh was um, charged with three private citizens making charges against her. When does it end? It's an everlasting um, cycle going on over and over again. What's your opinion on the most recent charges and the court case tomorrow? So those are two loaded questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. let, let's deal with the Plot Singh matter first. Um, Justice Singh has made decisions. She made two particular decisions. One, that she cannot by herself or with the help of her commissioners invalidate votes that a particular party who has an interest in having those votes invalidated by themselves. They just simply can't do that. She's also said that after the recount, they could not go back to the um, the Mingo figures. Look, we, we all know the Mingo figures were bogus from the moment he called them out. He knows that. The people who recorded it knows know that. And when we opened the boxes, the boxes confirmed um, that the, those figures were bogus. So she said very clearly, we can't go back to the figures. Today, three private citizens who are very connected to the APNU AFC with APNU AFC lawyers went to the court to say uh, they want to charge her for misconduct in office and essentially what the misconduct they're talking about not essentially the misconduct they're talking about is that she said she could not invalidate votes they want invalidated and she said she could not go back to the Mingo figures that's the misconduct they're claiming she 
uh, committed. Now, let me just say the Caribbean Court of Justice is our highest court. It's it's an apex court in the Caribbean, well, for Guyana and for other some other countries in the Caribbean. And, and this is what that court said uh, a week and a half ago. The idea that the CEO or GCOM could in an uncountable, unaccountable, non-transparent and seemingly arbitrary manner without the due processes and legal standards established in the Constitution and the Validation Act, disenfranchise scores of thousands of electors is entirely inconsistent with the constitutional framework. Whatever allegations of irregularity attended those votes, and we neither agree nor disagree as to the existence of such irregularities, must be adjudged by the High Court in an election petition. Now, the the CCJ, which cannot be overruled, said very clearly that GCOM, nor the, at that point they were dealing with low and field this, this um, invalidating votes, but they said very clearly the idea that the CEO or GCOM, Claudette Singh is a part of GCOM. She is one member of a, she's the, the chairperson of a, seven, a six member, seven member commission. The six persons are political nominees. Mm -hmm. They said very clearly that neither Claudette Singh nor Claudette Singh and a collection of her commissioners nor Claudette Singh and Lo and Field and a collection of them could invalidate votes. The idea that they believe that anybody believes they can do it is, is highly um, worrying for that court. And they said very clearly, unambiguously, that it cannot happen. Um, if there are complaints about irregularities that happened and they did not want to decide whether they believe those or not, they should be after a victor is declared, because they went on to say that, by the way, after a victor is declared, that means after she says who wins the election, they can take it to the high court as the laws provide. So whoever sued Claudette Singh today is suing her to do something because she did not do something that the court, Caribbean Court of Justice is saying she cannot do. So here is the Caribbean Court of Justice saying, Justice Singh, you cannot do this. And the part, the APNUAFC today sued her to say, you must do what that court told you you cannot do. And because that is so ridiculous, the DPP needs to get up tomorrow morning. I expected it to happen this afternoon, and I suspect that it may not have happened because there may just have been a floating around of information. I'm not even sure as far as I saw, I didn't see it signed by a magistrate. And I know as far as I saw in the in the news, I was uh, out of touch with the news for a little, for many hours today, but as far as I saw in the news, Justice Singh is saying she was not served with that. Now I am saying that the Director of Public Prosecutions has the power to null pros any kind of charge that is bad in law or that is not in keeping with um, bringing good law and order to the country. The director of public prosecutions had no problems, no processing um, charges, cr private criminal charges brought against four ministers where the matter was much, much stronger, uh, a case to be heard than this, where the CCJ is telling us that she can't do this. So I suspect the reason it's not null process yet is because it might not have been served, it might not even have been filed. Let's assume that. Let, if it is filed and if it is served, the DPP needs to do her constitutional duty tomorrow and I'm making that public call now and null process these matters in a blink simply because they absolutely make no sense. What they're asking her to do is what our apex court has already said she cannot do. She cannot do. So that's the first one. The second one you asked me about is, uh, you, you, uh, maybe we should pause here and let other people talk about that particular matter before we move on to tomorrow's of matter. Of course, this one, because it's a lot. Yes. Um, Ms. Lam, <laughs> what's your opinion of the private criminal charges against retired Justice Claudette Singh? What was interesting to me, and I saw it with the CEO as well, is the fact that private criminal charges had to be, you know, filed for him. Now, I have not seen anything from Justice Singh that would tell me that she has not. And in, and in fact, I admire her patience and her resilience because quite frankly, there have been times where she could have acted. There was there were there were no court cases, no injunctions stopping her. And yet still she allowed the due process. So I am not sure why 
someone would attempt to file those charges against her. Because, for instance, um, just before we got to the appeal matter, um, you know, which we heard tomorrow, um, the lawyers for the um, Masenga Jones indicated that they would be filing an appeal, and they asked if, you know, she would hold, because of course there was nothing in that judgment from uh, Justice George that would that stopped her, and she allowed that. So I'm not quite sure where. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I, I was just listening to Priya, and she's of course saying that there is no um, possible way that that matter could e should even get to the court court steps in the first place. But again, I've seen nothing, and as a result of that, I um, what was interesting though was person saying, "Well, it's tit for tat. You you know you filed an, um, a matter against the CEO, and therefore it's our turn." You know, it's precedent. I've, I saw that word floating around on social media all day today. My personal opinion, I don't see anything that she's done wrong. She has been resolute. She has stood even when she could have acted. And she's allowed all the parties. I saw during the recount, you know, attempts to ensure that all parties were comfortable in terms of matters that were heading to her. It frustrated one side. It made the other side feel better. But again... Those charges make no sense to me, and interestingly enough, they can only be filed privately, which means there is no nothing public that she um, for a public officer that can be done. So that route to me makes no sense. And but again, any citizen of this country is entitled to filing, you know, matters, and the court will decide if it's merit. We just heard Priya say that there is no. Um, you know, no substance in law. And so we wait to see what tomorrow will bring. But I know up to at least this midday, um, I saw a news article stating that she had not received it. And there, and she, and you know, her sternly rejecting that she, she committed any crime. All right, Gail, what do you think about the cases against Ms. Claudette? Well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't go in that direction. I'm a politician. And so the issue is, what is the objective of the case? I agree Then I, I listen to people who are legally, uh, legal advice uh, from people like Priya. There is no basis for the, 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 the charges. This is pure bullyism and intimidation. This is about trying to frighten Claudette, trying to make her comply with the demand, which she has not complied with thus far. And so it is about trying to remember in the last, since weekend, I think it was, suddenly you had this letter come out saying she must resign. And therefore they're now recognizing that the court appeal case tomorrow, I'll leave Priya to analyze that, but we hope that they will lose it. You have, um, and therefore, we're moving towards a declaration and a declaration of the recount at some point in the near future. Their only hope now is to try to intimidate Claudette Singh, Justice Singh, and to bully her, to get her to either resign um, or to be afraid for her safety, etc. And that's what they have been doing to her. And she's been resolute so far. So I think this is more part of the construct of the APNU to force um, Claudette to comply with what they want her to do. They didn't succeed um, uh, before in their different efforts and they maybe have one thing left and that is to try to frighten her or intimidate her. This, the other issue though, to go back to the point Rhonda made about, um, well, private criminal charges were against law and feel and therefore is kind of tit for tat. The difference is that Lowenfield was exposed by the international observers who saw and including yourselves who were there. In other words, there's evidence, hardcore evidence and the spreadsheets and and the uh, SOPs and the SORs um, that were the, uh, what do you call the matrix or the spreadsheet produced by Lowenfield not matching the SORs um, during the recount for Region 4. And therefore, the fact that private criminal charges are brought again for an election offense, offense for criminal offense for trying to steal the elections is not uh, comparable with what are the charges being brought against Claudette Singh. When you read the, this, the document, which was 
it made no sense whatsoever. It didn't even accuse her of what kind of, what law did she break? What what offense did she commit? Other than to say that she was at committing a, a, a something unlawful. So I, I think that the two are not comparable and we need to be able to explain to people because that's the APNU narrative to say, well, uh, BBB and, and, and TNM bring, so therefore now is APNU turn. And I think that is just trying to justify what is really um, bullyism on the part of APNU. We shouldn't condone it whatsoever. All right, thank you very much. I personally believe it's very vindictive. She has yeah. always acted within the confines of the law, and I believe it's a way to buy more time to do whatever it is that um, their objectives are. <laughs> we have to figure that out. But five months going down with everybody tired and fed up of what's happening, to do something like that against Claudette Singh at this point in time is terrible. I've seen full out attacks being thrown at women. At Honorable Mia Motley, look at the way she was disgraced. At Claudette Singh, they had a coffin with um, um, quote unquote her inside. Any woman, Rhonda Lamb's children were even thrown up out there by them. Priya Manichan had it several times. I had my fair share also. We as women, every time we take a stand for something we believe in, for the mere fact that you're a woman, they try to find something about it to put you down. And that was my personal experience looking on. Let us say not even as a politician, simply looking on. It's always a struggle for us and we always have to fight twice as hard to get where men normally are. And I must say that I'm happy that I'm here with some strong women tonight and we represent and show out for all the young people coming up that say that, you know, one day I would like to do it. And the strength that we show, everyone here on this panel has shown, I believe motivates them and helps them to go forward. So let's speak a bit about the court case tomorrow. My question is, where does it end? It's a never, never ending cycle so far, somebody said to me when they called. Priya, can we start with you again, since you're the legal yeah. mind on the panel? Uh, thanks, Asha. Um, the everybody has a right to file and I believe that with everything in me. Um, I think the courts have been very commendably swift. I, I don't think you understand what that means, but people who are waiting for years to have their appeal heard probably are their head is spinning because we've had like five matters heard so far through the high court, through the full court, through the court of appeal, it's reached the CCJ, all of this in a very short time. And so the courts have been extremely industrious in, in getting this done um, and getting these matters heard. Tomorrow, the matter before the Court of Appeal discusses um, Justice George's, Roxanne George's decision. Justice Roxanne George is the acting Chief Justice, where she said very clearly, Mr. Lowenfield cannot be a lone ranger. He can't sit down by himself in an office or at Congress place and decide which votes to throw away and which votes to keep. Now, there is nothing unnatural or abnormal about the decision. As I said, this is an office. This year it's occupied by Keith Lowenfield. I suspect very strongly he will not be in that office for another election. But next election, let's assume it's John Singh or Champawati. And they, whoever occupies that office does not like the winner of the election. And they try to do exactly what Mr. Lowenfield is doing. Then we have a country that is going to be in a cyclical sort of sickness. And we simply cannot allow that. In the name of Guyana, we can't allow it, apart from it being wrong and so on. So nothing that Justice George said. She just simply said he can't be a lone ranger. He cannot go and invalidate votes by himself. Now, the Court of Appeal is reviewing that tomorrow. The Court of Appeal has already ruled. And um, in, in twice in election 2020 elections related matter matters and based on what they have said before and based on what the court above them has said which is the caribbean court of justice by which they are bound i could predict tomorrow that the court of appeal is going to uphold justice george's position that mr lowenfield cannot invalidate votes by himself he has, they have to go to the high court through um, 
uh, a petition. I suspect strongly they're also going to uphold the position that these matters are res judicata. That means they were heard and overheard and overheard. Same issue, heard 100,000 times. And that it doesn't matter if you bring 217,000 persons, who's different persons 217,000 times. Once it's the same issue, the same matter, it is something that we consider in law. Um, res judicata, which simply means it was considered before, it was decided upon before, and there must be an end to litigation. So I, if I were to predict what would happen tomorrow based on the fact that the Court of Appeal itself has ruled and has um, and is bound by the Caribbean Court of Justice's ruling, and that court, like I read for you in paragraph 47, has already said, neither the law and field nor the GCOM could invalidate votes by themselves. Um, or they would not be acting constitutionally, the court has no choice but to rule to uphold Justice George's decision. The PPP, well, through its general secretary and its presidential candidate also appealed whether Justice George even had jurisdiction to deal with the matter. So that's up in the air also for, for them to decide. But before we discuss, so that's all on merit. I mean, I don't know what they'll do, but we'll hear soon enough. But I also wanted to comment on the rank vile abuse that Priya Sunarine Bihari had to put up with. Um, she's a high court judge. She is, and people don't realize this, one of the more senior judges in the high court. And she was appointed to the Court of Appeal, just like Justice Brassington Reynolds was appointed to sit at the Court of Appeal. He's not a Court of Appeal judge by the Chancellor. She had no choice. You don't have a choice in these matters unless um, there's something extremely special in law that prevents you from hearing the matter. Um, and she went up there and we heard from um, candidates and representatives from the AP and UAFC for a prolonged period. I listened to this hour upon hour of call-in. It appeared to me to be pre-arranged call-ins where her, her gender was attacked, her youth was attacked, her race openly, her ethnicity was attacked, her, who she went out with, who they imagined she went out with, because I don't believe she did. Yeah. But, uh, you know, her vagina came into the discussion um, and it was just disgusting and vile and sickening. And this here is from Granger, who said he's honest and decent and he has integrity. And, and Mrs. Granger, who has spoken before and could have said something, in my view, about stopping this because I saw it in one day, it happened at 12 o'clock, five o'clock and eight o'clock in one day. And I'm saying after the 12 o'clock show, they should have said, don't you ever do that again to any of the females hearing these matters or dealing with these matters. Kim Kai John was, was Kim Kai John is, was the former solicitor general under the AP and UAFC government. Yeah. The AP and UAFC has not appointed anybody that they are not sure of in those kinds of positions. So I would assume Kim voted for them, which is her right. Kim Kai John led the arguments, and I was so proud to watch it, um, although I disagreed with every word she said, led the arguments um, against the, the third term matter in, in, in the CCJ. Kim Kai John has acted against um, persons that what I would consider comrades and close friends. She was simply doing her jo job. Again, Kim was attacked based on her gender, her looks, who she's dating. The person she's dating was attacked. Um, it, it was horrible. Again, coming from yeah, mid, mid, mid level um, persons, men from the AP and UAFC and, and not being stopped by the by the leadership of the AP and UAFC. Justice Roxanne George, a woman who came back, taught at the University of Ghana for many years, excelled at the chambers of the, of the DPP, um, rose to the bench and made was made acting Chief Justice. And I mean, look, I, I, there, there are many things I could say. Two weeks ago, Justice George ruled against me and I think she was wholly wrong. I still think so, but she doesn't think so. But <laughs> she ruled against me. That does not make her um, all these horrible things that she was called recently, that she would not have been called 
if she ruled for the AP and UAFC. So what the AP and UAFC want is people who are going to rig the election with them. And if you're going to hold your position of being having integrity in your pro profession and doing what's right, then um, you are going to be attacked. And if you are female, the attack is going to be gender based. You're going to be told about how you look. You're going to be told about who you slept with. You're going to be told about who they think you slept with. Um, you're going to be you're going to be called whore and wild and loose and all these are the words. And it is something that we must discuss or we must stop shying away from it and we must call people out when they do it. I one of the saddest parts of this election for me is I can't unsee some people. I cannot. I mean, I have the peculiar thing of of being angry with someone and forgetting why I was angry with them, but not this time. I mean, I, I can't unsee some of what I've seen. I'm, I'm stunned that some of the gender specialists that I looked up to, that I felt made real contributions to this country, that are lecturing in these positions, have stayed quiet or joined these attacks, either subtly or under um, put on it. So, and I would never be able to unsee that. And that for me is a, is a horrible thing. I saw today the general secretary of a large trade union, a candidate for the AP and UAFC, calling retired justice um, Claudette Singh evil. Like, how do you represent the majority of your, your membership, which would be female, if this is how you could... Um, look at other women it's it's frightening and like i said for me it's, it's going to be very very difficult to unsee those things and unlearn what i've learned about about some people for me there is a there is a point that the ap and uafc is going to have to give up is going to have to give up and then all these positions that people were told to take who didn't think for themselves and who didn't hold their own principles and say no way i'm not simply not going to do that they are going to be left exposed. The AP and UAFC is a party, is a thing, but people, persons, will be left exposed based on their their really atrocious behavior towards these these senior women over the last couple of months. Thank you, Miss um, Lam. You have seen women being attacked. You have seen misled party supporters. But what do you believe is the solution to the problem? Because whether we like it or not, they do have um, almost half, let us call it almost half um, of the vote supporters, who I do believe that the problem comes from the leadership itself, because if they were honest with their supporters, we wouldn't be in this position right now. But what do you think is the solution to the problem that we are having? Which one of the problems? Well, the, the, the fight between the supporters. <laughs> I understand there are a lot of problems. I had to, you know, I, I had had to ask, ask, you know, you have to be a little more specific. <laughs> I'm not sure that I could, you know, I have, I've mulled it around, tossed it around in my head. You know, I don't think there's one organic solution that we can come up with. What we've had over, let's, let's go take it all the way back to the no confidence motion. Because, you know, persons are, a lot of people are, are assuming that this fight started, you know, just after elections. What you have was a building up of this wronging, you know, the, from the no confidence motion as if it wasn't provided for in law, as if, um, you know, it wasn't, well, we know the CCJ said it was lawfully passed. And so what you had from then was a building up of resentment, a lot of propaganda, and that was being fed to the beasts. Um, and that kind of, of, of feeding over 19 plus months has brought Guyana to, you know, the abyss, I, I like to call it. And there, there's just, there are just a few people who literally st standing there kind of holding us back from falling over. What it will take is dialogue. The problem is when we toss around this word dialogue, um, you know, you're going to hear, oh, but, well, APNU AFC offered to dialogue and, and, and all of the opposition parties said no. And I said this last night on a program. We don't get to change the rules in the middle of the game because we don't like it and we don't like who's won. What we have to do is follow those rules as they exist within the Constitution. And then afterwards, 
when that government is legitimate, legitimately sworn in, we make the changes and we or we advocate for those changes. And persons feel that you know you have to be in parliament to do it. What is going to, what it is going to take is a level of maturity that I am yet to see. Now, mind you, we've been independent for 54 years. I am only 41. And what I have seen within the last 19 months is literally, I'm not even sure if dialogue alone will work. There are persons who have a genuine belief in what their party is selling to them. And there's a saying in Ghana, even Jesus himself could come down or, or you know, God himself could come down and tell you X or Y and you're still not going to believe it. But the reality of it is, it's going to take a lot of dialogue. It's going to take a lot of reaching out to each other. And so I can't think of any one solution. I can't tell you, well, I think this will work or that will work. But it requires a level of maturity that I'm yet to see, um, especially from grassroots supporters. I know they've been fed a steady diet of propaganda. All throughout that recount, I sat there and I kept wondering, I was like, I'm, do these people know that I'm sitting in this room as well? You know, so what you have is an attempt to change the rules of the game in the middle of the game. And you're going to extend that through any number of, of methods. And then you'd want to turn around and ask those same people, you know, let's talk. And in reality, it's probably the only solution at this point. But what you have is one side who've been fed a diet, a steady diet of propaganda, um, full-fledged lies, half-truths all of those things and then those same people asking for dialogue and the other half of the population going but that's not what it is so for me i think the first step is dialogue but given all of the things we've experienced in the last 19 months it is going to take a lot of maturity it's going to take a lot of level-headedness that i'm not currently seeing coming and you have to come out to the fore and, and work from there but again, I'm a, I'm a, people tell me I'm a perennial optimist and therefore I have faith. You know, it's going to happen. We, a lot of the women that I see from all of those parties, all, uh, you know, the new ones, the old ones, I believe we are going to have to lead that charge. That is just my personal opinion. And we're going to have to say, okay, cool heads prevail, let's go from there. And we take it from there and we have that conversation. Thank you very much, Ms. Lam. We are going to go on a short break, then we'll return with Ms. Gail Teixeira. Hey, America, let's put fun back into the summer with safe train vacation packages to Washington, D.C. from New York City. That's right, you heard it. Travis Span got your train vacation packages from New York City to Washington, D.C. This four days, three nights trip will include round trip coach train tickets, three nights hotel accommodations, a multi day hop on, hop off sightseeing tour of Washington, D.C., and a Monuments by Moonlight tour. You heard it here first Travis Span is offering train vacation packages this summer. Call Travis Pan at 718-845-0437 for rates and more information. That's 718-845-0437 and let's explore closer to home this summer. Travel plans, Travis Span. Globespan 24-7 continues its efforts to serve the communities. The platform provides for all sides to air their views and discuss solutions. Viewers in Guyana and across the world are participating in these discussions. Globespan's platform offers Guyanese an opportunity to express their concerns and discuss solutions in the political realm, thereby addressing the polarized situation. Discussions also include social ills, such as alcoholism, domestic violence, suicides, and much more that have been plaguing the nation. Globespan 24-7 platform connects the diaspora and the world with Guyana. The concept is helping to shape the development of Guyana. So Globespan 24-7 needs your support to continue to serve the communities. Go to Globespan247.com and pledge your support with from as little as $5, $10, $15, or $20 or any amount each month. Your support will help and go a long way to develop Globespan 24-7 as an independent platform that brings in all sides for the communities. By including all sides, we can bring long-lasting changes for all Guyanese. 
Log on to Globespan 24-7 today and pledge your support. Looking for a space to rent? We have space available for offices, apartments, and retails. We have two locations available on Lot 3A North Road, Georgetown, and Lot 55 South Public Road, Rose Hall Town. Contact us today for more information. You can contact 624-0692 or 337-4287. Welcome back everyone to Globes Fan 24-7. Tonight we have a very special all-female panel with the women in the forefront fighting for democracy. As we went on the break, Ms. Lam was explaining to us that she believes that dialogue would be the way forward at an opportune time after a declaration is made. Ms. Gail Teixeira, there's a court case coming up tomorrow. And I've asked the question, when is the ever-ending cycle going to end? But in your opinion, what are all these court cases instigating in the Guyanese population? What have you seen? How have you seen people reacting to this cycle that has been happening? I want to say something about the last five years to answer you. And that is that, as Rhonda said and so on, now reading the Constitution and stuff like that, Last five years, have, I think, has been an educational period for our people. When we've looked at the taxation and bills passed in Parliament by the APNU, people have had to recognize Parliament in a different way before. When we were in government, people kind of trusted Parliament is there and they're going to do their thing. In the last five years, people became much more conscious of what was going on in Parliament, what was the budget going to be, how is it going to impact on them and what were bills such as cybercrime with sedition and stuff like that? What would that happen? Well, how would it treat them? So the last five years, we've seen an emergence of what I call political consciousness in terms of the need to protect democracy. And so I'm going to try and come around to your question in that way. The And I want to say this publicly as an, the oldest person on this panel. What is fascinating about Guyana and our history is that the young leaders have always led it. When Chedi Jagan, when he was in his late 20s, Barrett becoming uh, president at 35, the youngest in, in the world. And again, we have now Irfan Ali, a young uh, person who's going to be a president at 38 or 39 years old. The young people have always been part of the struggle for democracy and when you look at the and in the struggle for against colonialism look at the photographs of the freedom marches all young people look at the photographs of the struggles for democracy and free and fair elections pre-1992 all young people in those days we were younger we were your age now we're not but each time, each, the, the, the cycle of the society produces the next batch of leaders who will be taking the country forward. One of the lessons of this period, too, is what we've learned. And, and, I, and this is what I want to say. When, when all the struggles of pre-92, they were difficult. There was a house of Israel. We got beaten. I got beaten. I got locked up etc cetera, etc cetera. we all went through and we have as women not only women but as men in that period our stories our stories to pass to our children and our grandchildren and so on and you will have those two but what we didn't think about after 92 and what we we felt that having had free and fair elections and building restoring democracy and constitutional reform that what we'd achieved in the 23 years, and I'm not talking just as PVPC, was that we would never see again election rigging, that that would never be part of Ghana's history again. What we have seen in the last 19 months is an attempt to prevent the elections, to hold back the elections, to delay elections, and once the elections have been held, to hijack the elections. And so what we thought as an older generation that we would not see this happen again in our country, it has happened again. And we have been able once again, with a brand new generation of young leaders and so on, and young people in civil society to be able to stop it. And, to, and so far, despite all the negative things, 
democracy is prevailing. It is holding out. It is stronger than what we thought it was. The foundation that was built in the 20 odd years has been able to withstand all sorts of shenanigans and manipulations to try to hijack the elections. And so these court cases are part of all of that uh, machinations to be able to delay, to confuse people. I, I believe strongly that the APNU is practicing a psycholo psychological warfare on our people. And the psychops, as is called, is one in which you wear down your opponent, you tire them out, you confuse them, you show, you throw smoke in their eyes and you confuse them. So they get tired after a while and they begin to comply. OK, subjugate us, you know, to to what the bully wants or the, the person who is practicing it. And we have shown that that we're not going to have that happen so that I feel really sad. And sometimes when I look at what's going on, that the fact that our generation felt that we had succeeded in planting the roots and the foundation of, of democracy, so much so that what Mr. Lohen, a Mr. Lowenfield did or a Mr. Mingo did would never happen again. Unfortunately, it did and it has. But what has been powerful is the fact that those embryos that were planted in the foundation for our democracy have withheld. What is holding us back from 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 as I think Rhonda you said about the, or Asha about the the precipice the edge going over the edge has been in fact the judiciary despite whether we disagree all the time with them or we agree with them the judiciary of this country has shown itself as the force that is actually preventing the country from going over the precipice so far. And so whether it is, and I, when I say the judiciary, I mean the entire judiciary, all the way up to our apex court, the Caribbean Court of Justice. And, and that is a powerful statement in relation to democracy when one of the key institutions of rule of law are the judiciary and they're able to withstand um, tremendous pressure in many cases that they have been able to, to show that they will stand on the side of the constitution and the law. And, and therefore preserve constitutional rule. So I, I think that that these cases, these two will pass. They will run out of lector, uh, what do you call legal options. They're going to run out of legal options sooner or later. Whether they lose the case on Thursday and they run to the CCJ, I don't know what they're going to tell the CCJ if they lose. Whether they bring charges against Claudette and, and Singh and they bring them before the case, um, all this will pass, all this will pass because the foundation on which they're, they're carrying out this, these uh, actions are based on untruths and based on lack of evidence, just merely to manipulate, to manipulate the end. And what's the end is to stay in government as long as possible, to hold the reins of government uh, and to stay in and to refuse to respect the will of the people and that that so I can't give you a legal answer on that, but I can give you what I think is a political answer. And that is what I think is the strategy that they're playing. The APNU has a strategy as much as um, we may think it is totally delusional and, and psychotic and so on. It is a strategy and that is what they're trying to succeed in to either stay and hold on to the reins of power regardless and or they've been trying to get themselves sworn in as the government, the new government, and they're not going to see, succeed on either one of these. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to remind our audience that something that makes this election very unique is that just after the electoral process, we're faced with a pandemic. As we all know, COVID-19 cases are going up in Ghana right now. I personally am a doctor working with my patients all the time. I know I would have loved to participate in the recount process, but I had the hard decision of making whether I had to be there for the patients or be there with the recount. But due to blessings, I had a wonderful team who came and helped out with everything going forward. So I know everybody here has been actively participating in efforts going forward to help the Guyanese people. Even though there is a government acting in place right now, we have still seen suffering, and we have personally played our part in it. Myself as a doctor, I know 
Yale, you have made several efforts that we're going to discuss now. So let me start with Ms. Lam. COVID-19 and the election. What's your experience? What are the flaws in the system that you've seen and how have you helped it so far? Um, one of the most important things um, that governments the world over, and I've been looking especially at um, countries being led by women, what we saw were those attempts, well not attempts, full-fledged efforts by governments to offer assistance to the population. What we have here and still have is that unique uh, situation where parliament is dissolved. The budget is very strained in terms of how much you can legally spend. And so the response that you would expect from a government in terms of subsidies, in terms of all of those items that would have been necessary, you know, assistance, we've seen uh, persons have received rent assistance, uh, lots of job assistance. In fact, the government response only came on, I would say, within the last month and a half. And it is nowhere near to being sufficient for those families that have been struggling. What, we, what I did, along with the other members of our team, was we literally canvassed the diaspora as well as local Guyanese. I mean, I used my Facebook page to beg. I begged everybody, you know, I, I implemented something called an argument tax. If you wanted to argue politics with me, it would cost you a hamper. And whilst it, I knew it would only, you know, manage for a family of four, possibly two, three weeks, you know, for larger families, we tried to accommodate them. But it was, lo it was literally ordinary Guyanese citizens living in Guyana and living abroad who assisted with that. And so what we tried to do was to ensure that families did not go hungry. And so over, uh, uh, you know, six regions, I've, we've also partnered with individuals um, for the indigenous communities. Um, and so, as I, what, for instance, quite recently when region one was hit very hard with, the, with COVID, we partnered with a small team from that, um, you know, of not residents, but persons from there, to send in much needed assistance. And we saw that all over Ghana. Um, I know some friends in Barbies who did it. I know some friends in Esequibo who would have done Ordinary citizens stepped up to the plate. And that was something that, whilst admirable, because of the situation, and again, I say to people, do we not have a heart? We are in the middle of a pandemic and you are sitting here fighting for power. And I remember saying to somebody, I hope the people fighting for power like this remember and the same efforts are given to the Guyanese people who are suffering during this pandemic. So those were my personal efforts and the rest of the team, massive support, but it was ordinary citizens who stepped up and we also had a lot of corporate support and we were able to send off quite a large sum of, of money in terms of goods and cash received to assist families from the, I would say, just about the end of March, heading all the way down to quite as recently as a week ago. And the problem is what we which we have now is those resources are now drying up. And because we have an extended COVID period, it's going on and on, and our people have now reached their limits in terms of assisting. And so that with that assistance drying up, those families are still very much in need. And I worry because I know the single moms, I know the, I know the single dads, I know the families who have disabled children or disabled family members. And the governmental response to that is just not sufficient. So that is my, that is my fear that the longer this goes on, the more our people will struggle and they're already struggling. Thank you very much, Ms. Lam. Gail, I know you had a lot of projects going on amidst COVID-19. Would you like to share your opinion on COVID-19 and this election, what has been happening and how you believe it should be improved? As a, a former Minister of Health during the cholera epidemic, uh, when countries around us were thousands of people were dying from cholera in uh, 1992, 
we had much less resources, financial and otherwise, in October 1992 um, than we have now with a budget that this government has had for health of um, 30 odd billion per annum. My budget in those days was 200 million per annum. And we had a cholera epidemic with, with um, that was coming across the Venezuelan border. And the, the strength of the Guyana health sector has been the public health sector. Unfortunately, I've been pained watching what has happened in this period. Um, there is no reason why Guyana couldn't have been prepared. There's no reason that WHO gave warnings long before. They didn't buy PPEs, the what you call um, personal protection equipment. You and I, Asha, talked about this. Um, they didn't buy the gowns, the shields, the, the things that health workers would need in a pandemic. They didn't buy drugs. They didn't buy the test kits. Paho gave them test kits and they were handing them out like sweet, like, like as if they were gold or something. And, and in the interior regions where right now the, the largest percentage of cases is in one, seven, eight and nine. And it is unforgivable, it should never have happened. But in that period, that early period, they were restricting the interior regions to own, giving them three test kits, three to test people in those areas. And that's why I said that, that I started out in March um, saying that they were woefully unprepared. I am saying now in the end of July that their, their management of COVID-19 has been literally criminal in terms of the abject neglect of our people and the, the uh, no relief to the poor and vulnerable a uh, number of the groups that, that Rhonda spoke about, the abandonment of the interior of our country in the Armenian villages, basically. Um, it has been criminal and, and no help to, to, to the elderly. You have the, the homes for the orphanages, the children with special needs, the elderly. They have been asking the government for money because they're running out of funding, they're running out of food. Nothing is available. They keep being told after the announcement, after the announcement, after the declaration. It is criminal. They had money because, and I'll say this, if you have a billion dollars to go and try and fix up a dilapidated private ho hotel that it was owned by a financier of your party, you can spend a billion dollars on that. You've got to use that billion dollars in the uh, uh, acquisition of badly needed uh, medical and pharmaceutical supplies, protection equipment for our health workers and educational materials to explain to people what do they need to do. They've spent a fortune with a certain company that is owned by a minister to give awareness programs on television and radio. They're not reaching certain villages in the interior. They don't get in at all. And so I'm sorry to get wound up, but I'm really furious. And and today, I guess I got more news from some of the interior villages of more cases. And, and I just am um, furious. Let's put it that way. But before I go on, and that is that, as Rhonda pointed out, in the midst of the electoral crisis, in the midst of all this, what we have found is the mobilization of people. President uh, Irfan Ali elect, President elect Irfan Ali set up a group of us as national stakeholders in March 28th. And to go back to women, Asha and Rhonda and Priya, we got fabric and women, the majority of women freely sewed for hours and hours. The majority of those masks we did not pay for. They were given voluntarily by giving women bale of cloth and a group of them sewing. They had the, the pattern. 200,000 ma cloth masks were made under that National Stakeholders Forum with a number of civil society bodies, religious organizations, the Hindus and Muslims, etc., and sent to all 10 regions. Now, 200,000 is not enough for a population of 700,000. But the government didn't give out any. N95 masks that we, we were able to raise funds in the diaspora and, and to bring in several thousands of um, N95 masks to give out to the health workers in different parts of the country, not just in Georgetown. And then approximately 100 to 150 hampers per day since the middle of April to yesterday being given out. And so we have done what we can do. We're not in government. And yes, 
It is true that they don't have a budget, but they have one thirteenth of the budget of last year. Legally, they can use this year. What have they been using it for? Tonight, while more cases are going up in Region 7, they spend money to write on the roads, this, one of the roads, the big roads in Bartica, Black Lives Matter. That costs money. That money could have fed some very poor families I know of in Bartica, just Bartica alone. They're using the same thing to paint in front of Coffee Square. Yet there are poor people in this country who the combination of COVID and the elections are stalemate has led to real horrors in their lives. And so we have done as a, as a body of people who are not in government what we can do. Those who are in government who want to maintain and continue in government have abandoned our people, abandoned our people. And that is what I think is criminal. Thank you, Gail. Priya? Uh, Asha, I, just, I, can't, I can't really add to what Ron and Gail said, but I just wanted to point out that the Caribbean got hit with COVID at around the same time. So we went into lockdown or what our curfew was about a week after Trinidad, a week after Barbados, um, St. Lucia, Grenada, uh, St. Vincent and the Granite St. Kitts, these countries all got hit at the same time as us. Last week, Barbados recorded zero active cases. Barbados gave subsidies in food. They had organized plans about how their senior citizens would be dealt with and addressed during the period, how their single mothers would be addressed and deal with, dealt with. They had a prime minister who was um, beautifully briefing her nation and holding their hand as they went through this, as she had just herself gone through um, a major surgery. Uh, the other countries in Kitts, Grenada, these other countries are now recording zero active cases. Guyana last week recorded three deaths. Yesterday in 19 hour, in, in 24 hours, I believe, recorded 19 new cases. And that's because we have not dealt with this issue at all. Um, the government has completely failed to deal with the issue properly. Uh, COVID-19 has been misused to um, oppress people. Don't protest if you're protesting against the government. Misused, keep the Carter Center out. Um, misused uh, and applied only only subjectively when, when it suits them. Um, this is not a joke. This is something that has happened across the world and we see the, the, um, the casualties are. Oh, the thing about these pandemics um, or any kind of hardship, and I hate to do this, but, but the reality is it's the women who suffer more. When your water gets cut off because your husband can't work simply because the construction site he's working on can't open because the government said they're going to lock you up if they open, is the woman going to go and fetch water because she has to cook and she has to make sure the wares are washed and her children's um, clothes are clean and so on. When um, your light, lights get cut off or the light bills don't get paid in any circumstance, not only in Guyana, but women will tell you that they face the brunt of hardship in a way that is usually not recorded anywhere. There is a really beautiful book called Half the Sky that, that speaks very clearly to women being the majority in the world, but owning such, such little of the world's capital and suffering a um, hundred times more during pandemics or outbreaks or epidemics or any kind of poverty related um, uh, circumstance. And so we're on a program where we're talking about women and we, we have, so I, I, I feel particularly hurt that the money that we have, and I heard Rhonda say, you know, we didn't have a budget and that's true. And so money should not have been spent or illegally spent, but we saw a 350 something million dollar contract given to build a building that will do nothing or is not urgent at all at this time. We just saw a billion dollars spent to fix a hotel and call it a hospital. We see um, ministers going and using uh, money to do things to promote their political party 
Um, so money is being spent. It's just not being spent on the right things. And then they have stupid things like yesterday I got a call from Region 1. They have put in place copying from Barbados, I mean, without understanding our, or, or taking into account our own geography, the alphabetical order of pensioners going in to collect their old age pensions, which is, you know, it makes sense. But when you're going to paddle for seven <laughs> hours to come out to be told that, I sorry, not seven hours, seven days to come out to be told that you're a W and you're going to have to come back next next week at this time, but you can't stay here because the COVID rules say that you can't come and stay here. You have to go home back. That is just stupid. It is done. It is um, it is not being using our initiative. You can't pluck something that Barbados has done and put it into the geography of Guyana um, uh, because that that creates so much hardship. Remember, pension is already over 65 years old. They got to come themselves. They paddle out for a couple of days to come just to be told you're a W. We can't serve you today. We have to serve you next week. How about could you please wait? until we finish with this uh the persons who are allocated today and we will serve you so you have all mismanagement and no interest in the meanwhile the ministers are traveling um and holding public meetings so um to talk about their party propaganda so the, the management of this thing has been a wreck in in already something that is so very infectious and that has caused so much pain across the world and for that alone um, the AP and UAFC should be relegated, really, to a place where they never have a chance to to uh, mess us up like this again. Thank you very much, Priyo. Well said, ladies. I'd like to remind everybody that we have a government COVID-19 task force that is mainly made up of non-medical professionals. That's right. I would also like to point out to the fact that the frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, and all the people putting their lives at risk have not been given any kind of compensation, any risk allowance. Even the ones working on the front line have gotten zero dollars. They spend time away from their families. The others have gone into the hinterland region to give their services, and no compensation has been given. They're very frustrated. And not to mention the lack of personal protective equipment. You have doctors, nurses, and health staff who have underlying diseases that cannot be afforded N95 masks. It's such, it's so terrible right now that we buy some Lysol and we spray our mask and we use this another day. And what does that do? It puts your life at risk. Testing has increased, but to whom? The, in the hinterland regions are still suffering, like Gail said. So there's a lot more to be done, more especially in the middle of the pandemic, like we can all agree. Ladies, we're coming to the end of our show. I'll thank you sincerely from my heart for being here tonight and sharing this um, discussion with our panel and with the audience in general. I'll invite each of you to give a brief closing remark. And thank you very much once again. Can we start with you, Gail? Oh. I just want to say that that again, I think what I said earlier was that um, I feel very confident about the future, even though at the same time there are great concerns we have about the threats to democracy and what could happen in the near future. But at the same time, I feel confident that our people, all of our people, and in particular our women and young people are in good hands and the country is in good hands for the future and the future generation. And I, I feel very proud to be at this stage of my life where I'm meeting younger women um, because one always wants to know that you, there's, you hand over, you keep going. That's what life is about, not for, as you said in the earlier program, fossils to hold on. I don't think I'm a fossil yet, but I do believe that we have to move forward and the next generation will lead the way. And I feel confident about Guyana in that way, and I feel confident that democracy will prevail. Just that it's going to take us, none of us are far see. None of us can see in the future, I don't think. So we're not sure if it's tomorrow, two days time, another week time. We're not sure. 
but it will happen. And so thank you very much for having me to be part of the panel. And I say good night to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Priya, can we have you next with your brief closing remarks? Yes, just brief. <laughs> I heard the word brief. Um, I, I want to say too that I was very happy to be part of this. I'm very pleased to see so many women um, involved, not only as these two presidential candidates that I was very happy to um, note during the campaign, but but the grassroots, the people who sewed for Gail, the people who packed yeah. those hampers for Rhonda, um, the, the girls and women who went and, and counted those ballots and recounted those ballots. Um, it's usually women in the forefront, not at the leadership positions, though, and that has to change. And so we can help to make that change. We are every time we see an attack based on gender or one that is subtly um, covered by things that could only be uh, be be uh, could only arise because of your gender. We have to call it out and we have to do that bravely. Our daughters must never grow up feeling like they have to hold back because uh, they could possibly be attacked by these vile, um, senseless, uh, childish, infantile, outdated bits of abuse. I want to say finally, just because I heard someone speak about the Black Lives Matter um, painting on the road at, outside of coffee and outside of, at, in Region 7, the Black Lives Matter movement is an important movement in this world and particularly in America at this time and it's a movement I support. I think there is, it is an insult to the cause of that mo movement to in any way link it with the rigging of an election or to use the movement and its cause to advance the attempt to rig an election. It is an insult to that movement and it must be condemned by all. Coffee and Damon, the places uh, people are going to, to pray for the, the successful rigging of an election, were freedom fighters. They would have led a revolution a violent, aggressive revolution against the Granger administration if they were living here in this time. Those people are heroes. They must not be brought down by these narrow racist agendas because we. I, I am sorry. I see it as nothing less than that. And I ask uh, blacks in Guyana and non-blacks in Guyana to not to be um, fooled or not to be caught up with emotive language that has no place and does not in any way advance the cause of democracy. This what is happening here is a naked attempt to rig the election using race and fear and courts and abuse. And we must all stop that because if there is a dictatorship, it doesn't see ethnicity and gender and geographical location. If there's a dictatorship, black people will suffer and Indian people will suffer and Armenian people will suffer, men and women and young people, old people, everybody is going to suffer because the kinds of things that happen in dictatorships, the kinds of rights we lose, the kinds of sanctions that we will have brought upon us will, will be suffered unto us all and our children instead of uh, searching for cures and inventing things, we'll have to fight a fight that Gail and them fought already, and we can't. That was our history. That cannot be our future, and we have it in our hands to make sure that it is not our future. So, good luck. I, I'm looking forward to, to the uh, um, ruling tomorrow and saying to all the women that I, I am very conscious of the efforts you make every single day to keep your house in order, to keep your schools in order, to keep your jobs in order and and to help this country develop and you will never be forgotten. Thank you very much. Rhonda, can I please have your closing remarks? This is for the people, our Guyanese people. We have seen a resilience. I mean, you know, growing up as a child, I always heard my relatives talk about the resilience of Guyanese and our hospitality and our warmth. However, I've seen that resilience. We have asked for it time and time again. Every time we had to respond to a court case, every single time that we had to go into the field and, and you know, offer some assistance. We saw, I saw creative ways families were attempting to you know, literally ride out the wave of, of our double hit that we, we saw in 2020. And so it is that resilience that will take us forward. 
Um, I've spoken to a lot of people who tell me, you know, oh, I feel so miserable. I feel so dejected. And I'm there trying to cheer them up and saying, but, you know, it's patience. Nothing lasts forever. And so this is the message of hope for our people. We are resilient. We are Guyanese. And at the end of all of this, you know, truth will prevail. Democracy will prevail. And it will be that resilience that our Guyanese people have, who have sat there and waited patiently. They've not been baited. They've not allowed themselves, you know, to be, as we say in Guyana, carried up the garden path. And so it is that that will win in the end. It is that resilience that will get us through. You know, I look forward to tomorrow's court hearing, not because, you know, I'm saying I can't predict how it will go, but I, what I'm hoping for is a, a 3 0 ruling because we've had these matters litigated over and over again. And to be quite frank, if we end up at the CCJ again for them to tell us, you couldn't count, you couldn't interpret words, and then they have to tell us a third thing. You know, at that point, I, my frustration level will probably step in. But I'm hoping for a 3-0 ruling, and I know that that resilience that our Guyanese people are famous for and what has gotten us to here is what will carry us forward. And as I will, you know, I'm, I'm leaving tonight and I want to thank you for having me, Asha. And I'm going to say to Priya and Gail, you know, we're watching that, that, that younger generation of women. We're watching and we're going to be ready to sound that first critical bell. And we hope you take that criticism in the spirit it, it, it is intended and that we literally never find ourselves here again. Because there is a large section of the Guyanese population, young women, older women, very small women, who we have to ensure that we never see this again for their sake. Because if someone had said to me in 2020, I'd be talking about rigged elections in Ghana, I would have laughed hysterically. I probably did when I realized what happened that day in Ashman's building. And then once the shock wore off, you know, I moved into action like every single other a woman that was present in that and saw it for what it was. And as Priya said earlier, a naked attempt to rig the election. Thank you very much. To our audience, I'd like to remind all the young women that are coming up and would like to consider politics to look at this panel tonight and tell yourself that these women have stood up for the democracy of Guyana and you can do it too. Do not be afraid. You can see we're in this fight. It's no longer an old fight of the PPPC versus APNU. It's a fight of the people of Guyana standing up for what they believe in and what is their right and justice. To the audience, I'd like to thank Nohar Singh for giving us the opportunity to be here tonight. If you'd like to contribute to Look Span 24-7, all details are on the page. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for interacting with us tonight. We're going to check the comments after and give some responses. And most importantly, thank you to the strong women that are here with me tonight for sharing your views and helping our population to learn a bit more about everything that's been going on. And with that, I leave you all and say good night. Thank you. Good night.